We say our goodbyes, shake hands, and make it clear without outright saying it that we now own this house. By the time we left the mansion grounds, sunset is almost upon us. So, you really want to buy this place then? That's a bit of a big impulse buy, even coming from you. <laughs> Not that I'm complaining. I feel elation when I hear those words from him. It's not every day one of one is able to please someone like Luke. He gives away false flattery to sway those who starve for his attention and approval. But in the privacy of closed doors, he would often express his grievances. He neither censored himself in front of me, nor spared me from his criticism. You have been saying the penthouse was getting a bit too small for you. Happy anniversary! Oh. That time of the year already? He forgot about it last year, too. I understand that he's a busy man, but... Is that why you want to buy it? Yes. You don't like it? I do. But I remember you used to talk about how you wanted to live next to the beach. Botany Bay, Kent. I remember the sea. Water that stretched on for miles and miles, as far as the eyes can see. As a kid, I loved our beach trips, swimming all day as much as I could. I was a well-behaved child, and the only time I was ever truly difficult was when I refused to get out of the waters, even when my fingers had gone all wrinkly. And even when they managed to pull me out of the water, there was always sand castles. The day before we married, I told Luke that I wanted a house on a beach and a dog. And a kid or two. None of those came true seven years later. That was a childish dream. Living next to the beach is so impractical if you really think about it. I don't know. It's not a bad thought to see you in a bathing suit every day. Maybe another time, love. We still have forever, don't we? He says nothing, only grabbing my hand and holding it tight, as we spend the rest of the ride home in silence. I miss the sea. Sick and hovering over the loo at three in the morning, the picture I paint right now is hardly glamorous. A horribly fishy taste is left in my mouth as I throw up what I had for dinner, and I hate the acrid stench that fills the laboratory. The burning sensation at the back of my throat is of no help whatsoever. I can feel another wave of nausea come up on me when the door opens. Hana, what are you doing so early out of bed? I'm fine, love. I must have just eaten something bad. That's all I managed to say before vomiting again into the porcelain throne. Lovely. Just go back to bed, Luke. I'm going to clean up here. I refuse to look at him. I don't want him to see me like this. The last time I've had a horrible morning retching into a toilet was during my college years, being the life of the party. Thoughtless and shameless, I'd thrown away months to frivolous merriment and pointless hookups. I didn't even retain any of the connections I had made from that time. Sure, they still know of me, and I still know of them. And we still do business from time to time. But I've lost touch with anyone who I didn't see on a daily basis. I hardly have any of the friends I had when I was still Hannah Evans. Teachers, fellow university students, drinking buddies, and old conquests like Jack. No, don't touch me, sweetie. It's disgusting. I'm disgusting. Luke sits down next to me on the toilet floor to hold my hair even as I cough up more fish. He wipes the vomit from the corner of my mouth and just stares. Do I need to fire someone? I don't feel sick. Just feeling a bit under the weather, dear. It's been unbearably hot as of late, hasn't it? I do wish it would rain. Are you sure it wasn't those sweets? I told you not to eat those sweets. <laughs> Maybe. Well, don't laugh. 
<laughs> well, <laughs> I can't help if you make that sort of face. <laughs> He starts chuckling, and soon enough, he's in a fit of laughter. The scene happening next to a loo filled with sick just makes the whole thing bizarre, and it nearly makes me start giggling as well. I try to stifle it, though, as I smack him on the shoulder. I'm not making a face, Luke. Stop laughing. Shut up. When he would not stop laughing, I let myself go as laughter bubbles from my own throat, and I forget whatever ill feelings plagued me. We're just husband and wife laughing together at a funny face, the little things in life. I let myself go because I know that these moments will not last forever. But if I know the terrible things that are to come for us, I would have wished with everything I I have then and there that the laughter stayed. Does he sleep in that suit? Uh, hiya! Come on now! Duh! It Jeez. seems like it. <laughs> Gotta look nice, even when you're sleeping. The place is bustling with movers, carrying furnishings here and there, along with several trunks of personal belongings taken from our penthouse. Luke watches them like a hawk, making sure nothing is handled carelessly or gets stolen. Careful now. I know your pictures are framed by cheap plastic, but those are framed by African Blackwood and are one-of-a-kind commissioned paintings. Each one is easily worth a lifetime of what you lot make. Luke, do the dishwashers go into the kitchen or the butler's pantry? Pantry, buttercup. Careful, that's a mah... No, no, you there, put that down. You do not manhandle a Napoleon Abueva. I can see the exasperation, and I have to send the foreman an apologetic glance. Even Johans rolls his eyes as he goes by. Considering Luke is always like this during a project, Johans and I have gotten used to it. Poor Marianne, on the other hand, looks a bit stressed at seeing the gigantic mess, before quickly going back to work. Everything just has to be perfect, exactly the way he wants it. One little thing out of place, one little thing that didn't fit the image clearly constructed in his head, and Luke gets bent out of shape. Sweetie, why don't we go and sort your suits upstairs? Let your Hans and Marianne and the foreman deal with the rest of the work. We have this, Mrs. Wright. Yes, please do go before a blood vessel bursts. Blood stains are so troublesome to clean. Taking him by the hand, I lead him upstairs into our bedroom. This place has been arranged first so that we can get some rest, no matter what state uh, the rest of the mansion is in. I'm definitely glad I can just lay down on a soft, comfy bed after what has been a busy morning. Watching Luke act like his life depended on getting this move done is tiring all on its own. And to think I have the whole day of this ahead of me. I feel the bed dip beside me as Luke sits down with a sigh. Well, I can't wait for this to be over. I don't know. It's fun seeing you all fired up. Here at home and not at work, you know. You know I can't always be home, Hana. I have a company to run, unless you've forgotten. I haven't forgotten. You're the one who insists on being there to make sure each and every little thing is under control. I just... I just really miss you sometimes, and I wish you were at home more often. Why, if you're not careful, I might go a bit loopy and I'll start bringing cats home. And soon enough, one day you'll find yourself going home to a farm just filled with felines that follow you everywhere. Oh, don't bluff. The things would shred up your precious furniture. Besides, you don't even like cats. True, true. Dogs are infinitely superior, of course. But what about the wet dog smell? The mess? I'm not cleaning up after a mutt, no matter how cute. If you think about it, a cat would be better. <laughs> <laughs> we laugh. 
It's not always that we can just lie down and talk about these sorts of things. To joke around as if we're teenagers again, with very little problem in the way of responsibilities and roles. To hear his genuine, honest-to-goodness laughter is a rarity. This is just the second time as of late. And I can only see it as signs of good things to come. All good points. I guess we could just have kids. That is, if you prefer dealing with soiled nappies and sick as opposed to dead birds, mice, and litter boxes. I've already told Marianne about turning the second bedroom into a children's room. I guess sometimes I don't know when I'm crossing a line. I didn't say that I am a good comedian, did I? Not this again. What? I... I wasn't being serious. It's not something you take the piss out of. Having a kid is a big responsibility, Hannah. We've talked about this, haven't we? We... I'm not ready to be a parent. I'd probably end up killing the little brat by the week's end. What should I say? You'll be a great mother. Carly likes you well enough. I went up. The mention of our little goddaughter places a conflicted look on his face. Sometimes it is cute when he denies having a soft spot for the little girl. Yes, well, it's Kylie. The tyke likes everybody and, on the off chance she doesn't, likes them well enough as long as they buy her sweets. And sure, that kid is great, but if I get tired of her, I can ship her back to her father at the end of the day. Having kids of our own will be a whole different monster entirely. I've never heard him talk about his father in anything but a business context. I recall Damien Wright kept hearing about him from my own father, even before I met Luke. The business world praised him for running a tight ship, all until one mistake led to a great loss for the Enterprise. It was then that the news of Luke Wright, prodigy son and successor to the old man, started to show up and he aided in its recovery and growth up until the Great Recession. I'm getting a bit off track. Regardless, I have never heard him talk about his father like one would talk about family. I think you'll be a great father. There's a smile. No matter how half-hearted it may be, I do really think that. He might not be a good, honest man. A part of me knows that though I try to silence it. But I know Luke well enough that he will be a, gr a better father than either Damien Wright or he Henry Evans. I love my father, but he never had the time. If it is any consolation, I think you'd be a decent mother. On the other hand, I have never heard of his mother. The silence settles, but both comfortable and uncomfortable. There is a familiarity in each other's company, despite the awkwardness that had transpired. Defenses and masks down, without anyone else looking. We are both together and alone in this quiet. But a crash from downstairs startles us both out of our reverie. Luke lets out a heavy sigh before coming up to his feet and straightening his jacket. I'll have to attend to that, then. Be good, darling. And watch out for your blood pressure. He gives me a kiss on the cheek before leaving while I lay there in a day. Alone as per usual. I really should be used to it by now. I can feel the minutes tick by me with... I can feel the minutes tick by me just laying there. Feeling miserable and full of self-pity. I have rolled over to lie on my stomach at this point, with my face buried into the pillows when there's a knock at the door. Grumbling at them to go away doesn't work as my voice comes from the other side. Madam, the photographer from Luxury Living is here. Wait, is that today? Oh yes. People had caught wind of our new mansion the very moment we left the open house. 
Luke had boasted he had he could acquire the property in no time and allowed a photo shoot for an interior design magazine to be scheduled today. Well, there were complications, and it took longer than it usually does for us. In a minute, Hanzi. Johannes, if you could at least make it through the end. Tell them I'll be right down, Hanzi. The mansion grounds have been one of the first things to be fixed up aside from the bedroom. Although it's still a work in progress, it had a promising start, and I can already see the flower patches. Luke's favored daffodils stands out easily, having been transplanted from the pots that used to that used to litter the rooftop of our penthouse. Why, if the moving crew thought that Luke was being hard on them, they clearly didn't see the landscaper on his way out. The man looked like he was ready to faint, and Luke seemed ready to kill him by the end of their discussion. It is in the gardens that I see him standing near the flowers in quiet admiration. He is hard to miss, the hunk of a ma the hulk of a man that clearly did not belong, and the big backpack and suitcase he has with him makes him look much larger. It is a peculiar sight seeing someone who looks like who looks like he does handling little delicate things with such care. He looks up from the gardens and does a double take before a friendly face replaces his serene expression. Miss Wright, yeah? Hi, uh, Zachary Steele here from Luxury Living, ma'am. Hope you weren't waiting too long. But it looks like you're still moving in, huh? Thought for a second there my calendar was wrong and I came here too early. The one and only. Welcome, welcome to Maison de Wright. And yes, We've been in the process of moving in as we were delayed, but it won't be a problem. They're just adding a few things here and there, and you should still be able to do your work. Where's the rest of your crew then, Mr. Steele? Zack is fine, please. Mr. Steele makes me feel like I'm a mascot for a cleaning product. Anyway, I'll be your one-man crew for today. Don't worry, been doing this gig for a while now. You must be quite the veteran to handle this on your own. We've had a full crew coming into our penthouse the last time we were covered in your magazine. Veteran? Oh, you, your words are too kind, Miss Wright. Hana! If I get to call you Zack, you have my permission to call me Hana. Alrighty then. Anyway, I'm no veteran, but I know my camera well enough to make sure this is a good shoot. You can trust me on that, Miss Wright. Hana. Zachary proves quickly enough that I can, in fact, trust him. His skills with a camera and experience in this industry, at the very least. He is kind and courteous, listening and following, as I lead him around the house. A really nice fellow, and he treats our household staff well whenever we cross paths with him. I answer his questions to the best of my ability, and he is patient enough to answer mine whenever I get curious enough. For one, I ask what the bags are for. They are quite the magician's toolkit. From inside, he had procured several items to embellish the interior with. Bowls of fruit, lemons, trays with pepper mills, stacks of cookbooks, mm. Cutting boards and glass canisters filled with colorful nuts and grains are brought in for a kitchen setting. For the bathroom, there are white towels, seashells, and decorative soaps. There are other things as well, too numerous to count, all in that large backpack and suitcase. Tricks of the trade. Softens up a room, makes a place feel more homey, and fills it up with texture. But you guys probably have better stuff I can use for this. No lights? Don't tell me all these are just props. Well, I've got my tripod here. For things like these, natural light is best. I'll just have to set the shutter speed to a real slow setting, and as long as nobody steps into the shot, it'll look great. Oh, it better. 
We go through the rooms one at a time, although we first tackle the ones that the movers have no business in anymore. The ballroom needs little preparation with its grand design. Although there is some trouble at first with the wide open space and the pictures being backlit. It is in the kitchen that Zachary's props come in handy. Considering how Johannes kept the place so neat and sterile, one can practically eat off the floor. We carry on touring the house and taking pictures where we can, with exception to the rooms which have yet to gain any purpose or design. Too bad I can't sneak a peek at his photos yet. Funnily enough, he is using a traditional camera. I didn't even know film still existed. With the way he speaks, however, I can see that he knows enough about his craft that I'm not too worried about botched photographs. I imagine photography must be cathartic to him, judging by how at ease he looks while taking pictures. There are small snippets of conversation in between the clicking of the camera. He even goes far as to talk about these terminologies like shutter speeds and aperture, when I ask about the technical aspects. I can't quite see the picture he, as it is made, much like when I watch artists paint on their canvas. But just watching someone passionately practicing their craft such as this is exciting in its own way. Going through the many rooms has been quite the exercise for both of us. Despite that, he has been so nice, and I find myself putting on my best smile. But it is as we're taking pictures in the foyer that everything comes to a standstill for a moment. Just a moment. And had I not been paying attention, I wouldn't have even noticed. It is merely a split second when Zachary's rhythm is put to a halt. His fingers doesn't seem doesn't move to release the shutter. Yet he doesn't pull the camera away from his face, gaze still firmly fixed through the viewfinder. His hands shake and there is a slight sheen of sweat on his forehead. Zachary? No response. Zach, is something the matter? Lowering his camera, he blinks and stares at something behind me before shaking his head. Turning around, though, I see nothing that could have gotten his attention. Oh, oh no, no, there, there, there's nothing wrong. I, I just remembered something that's all. Uh, let's get back to the pictures. Can you move a bit more to the left, yeah? I struggled to respond this time. There's a sudden weight on my back and an indescribable tightness around my throat. Everything stops. And everything starts again as I manage to choke out. If you're sure. I don't know what just happened. It, it probably was just a dizzy spell. I'm fine. And he said he's fine. We continue at the same pace as before, although there is an unspoken agreement that we will not talk about what happened. So, is this a full-time job for you then? Nah, I just freelance mostly for magazines, newspapers, and events. So you can't really call it a full-time job. It's fun and it puts food on the table, but it's not what I really want to do. At least, not all the time. What is it that you want to do then? Maybe I've been out of line sticking my nose into other people's business, but I can't help but ask. I regret doing so as I see his shoulders slump, and the easygoing air he has fades away. He looks torn over whether he wants to talk about it or not. Films. Documentaries, mostly. But cinematography is a lot more difficult than photography, right? I was working on this thing, actually. What thing? Well, it wasn't really a big thing. 
People didn't like Blue Foncy very much. People don't like a film about colors. I suppose they would have liked Blue Bibi a lot more. Very funny. So, Grand Director, do you want to tell me what Blue Foncy is all about? He hesitates. But when I refuse to budge on the matter, he gives in and spills it all out. Blue Flon Fonse. I'm not gonna read that. A uh, dark blue, the darkest hours of the Black British. He speaks with passion of one who has gone through the very matter he is concerned with. There is conviction, knowledge, and experience in his speech. Why, I would have told him that he was an amazing speaker, if only I wasn't so engrossed listening. Prejudice and discrimination in schools and in the workplace. Lesser chances for opportunity and higher chances of being treated like a criminal. He spoke of blacks and people of color in general, still being treated like second-class citizens. All because of the color of their skin. It is just positively, positively riveting and sad. It comes to a point wherein he loses steam. He looks abashed, realizing what he had just done. Sorry, I just got so carried away and... It's fine. It is really so fascinating to watch people talk about their passion after all. You should see how your eyes light up when you speak so fiercely. You do have very beautiful eyes. Uh-huh. Thanks, I guess. I want to say that I understand where he's coming from, but I really don't, do I? I was born with a silver spoon in my mouth, and I've lived a charmed life. It hasn't been perfect, but the difficulties I've been through pales in comparison to what others experience on a daily basis. I certainly don't know how I would have fared were it any different. Would I still have met Luke? And would he still have loved me if I were any lesser? What was your home like? These things you talk about, it sounds like you've... Well, I don't mean to pry, I mean. Hmm? I live with my older sister and my grandparents. We had a shop selling all sorts of things below our pop... Sorry, flat. And well, I was one of the few non-white, non-British students in class. I didn't get pushed around or anything straight up. Even then, I was one of the biggest kids around. But a pencil and notebook would go missing, you know? Oh, that I knew. Children can be so cruel at times. Of course, it may be a slightly different story when you have personal guards. And the stolen item is not a pencil, but an expensive heirloom. So what about you? How you liking your new house? It's nice, I suppose. You suppose? Not big enough? What? No, oh, don't be a bully. It's just that. I understand if you don't want to talk about it. I was a little girl, all dolled up and treated like fragile porcelain, with nursemaids waiting to me hand and foot. All the material possessions anyone could ever want, I could ask for on a whim, and it would be handed to me just like that. But I barely saw my parents, just goodbye kisses in the morning before they went off to who knows where they needed to be next. I saw them more often on the telly or in the papers than I ever did in person. I remember my old house. It was a lot like this one. Big walls and big holes, but nobody in it. Not really. It makes you think how alone you are. A pensive mood overcomes us. And there's a moment where neither of us are sure of how to go on from there. Things have gotten a bit too personal, yet it isn't wholly uncomfortable. 
Like as if we've been friends before. Well, that's normal, ain't it? You just moved here. You'll make home out of it yet. He certainly makes it easy to believe that. My childhood house is indeed a lot like this one. Just as large and extravagant. And just as empty. I hope he's right.